Our second speaker, also on Hannah Knight, just joined us from Vanderbilt, uh, Dr. Wendell Yarborough, is Section Chief of Otolaryngology, Professor of Surgery, Director of the Head and Neck Cancers Program. Uh, Dell is a clinician scientist, and he also brought up some of his research team from Vanderbilt, so I hope some of you uh, biologists get to know his lab folks who are located on the second floor at the intersection of Brady and Louder Hall. <coughs> Dell has joined up with Dan DeMeo in co-leadership of the Molecular Virology uh, uh, Research Program in the uh, Cancer Center. So uh, Dell, you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks to everyone for coming and Dan for such a, a great overview of um, the clinical uh, work that's going on here and sort of overview of what's going on in the past. And as you can see, it's pretty challenging for head and neck cancer um, to start thinking about moving into um, personalized medicine or targeted therapy. Um, and I think Dan's exactly right. There are no great targets right now um, based on mutation status that we know about. And so what I really want to do is talk about how to move this forward. And I'm going to focus on head and neck squamous cell carcinoma um, for this talk. I will um, talk also a little bit about uh, some other tumors we see in the head and neck, um, particularly salivary cancers, which are also interest of ours. And, and I just have this feeling, I don't know if it's true, that some of these non-carcinogen driven tumors may have a little better um, targetable profile than um, head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, which uh, seems to be pretty, pretty tough to target right now. And I don't know if these front lights go off, but I am going to show some foci and things like that. I'm going to try not to get too much into the, the nitty gritty of the science, which we've been presenting at some smaller meetings from people out of, the, out of my lab who actually do the work. Um, so if it is possible, maybe, aha, uh -huh, that's great. That'll probably be a little better. <laughs> Dr. Stern's ma uh, magic, he just uh, <laughs> comes up. And <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, here's, here's really the goal of our program. You know, we want to cure head and neck cancer, and uh, that's the bottom line. So the question is, how do you get from where we are to, um, you know, standing on this rock looking over the mountains? Um, so where are we now? Uh, Dan just reviewed a lot of things. So basically we have three modalities to treat head and neck cancer. Surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Platinum is a radiation sensitizer. That's sort of the standard of care. So Tuximab's come in, has a radiation sensitizing role as well. But um, you know, we, we really don't have a lot to offer people for recurrent metastatic disease. We don't have um, as good a cure rates and as low a morbidity as we would like to have. So we want to move from this, and don't get me wrong, I love doing surgery, <laughs> and I still uh, you know, think surgery plays a role, but we want to determine how we can get um, there. So we're at the beginning of this transformation, and you know, right now we're treatment guided by histology and location of the tumors, maybe HPV status. We're going to move to, uh, we have therapy with cytotoxic DNA damaging agent surgery radiation and basically want to get to treatment with uh, guided by molecular defects um, and how to target dysregulated molecules or pathways. And so really this is the way to do it and this is sort of the program. It's all centered around clinical specimens and patients that we see and treat but we have to get their tissues, we have to be innovative, do airway epithelial biology to determine de uh, defects and how to target these, um, and then have an iterative process with personalized molecular therapy, preclinical studies, and clinical trials looking for biomarkers. So I just put a plug in for this. This is at the root of most of the things that we do and most of the thing in, in, in lab and translationally, and that's, that's already started here um, at Yale with a um, 
biospecimen repository and the idea is to use the biospecimen repository. So, so we want to give these tissues away um, at much less cost than what it takes to uh, accrue them or zero cost so people can just request them and get them and the idea is to engage people that like you who are translational or basic scientists that have a favorite molecule that's perhaps dysfunctional in head and neck cancer um, and help us to determine molecular defects in these tumors. So how do we do personalized therapy? Most everybody here is familiar with this list, you know, with the Levac story with CML, um, with the advances in lung cancer and melanoma more recently, and uh, near and dear to head and neck surgeons is the RET mutation medullary thyroid cancer with the recent approval of a drug for treatment of those tumors which had absolutely nothing to do other than for those tumors other than surgery. So we need to find subsets of tumors and, and who responds. So this is even a more detailed uh, analysis of lung cancer that's getting finer and finer slivers of the pie <laughs> that define them. And I, that's what I hope is going to happen with head and neck cancer. Um, and, you know, the bright side of it is now drug companies are kind of interested in head and neck cancer, whereas before they weren't. The reason being is because they realize a sliver of head and neck cancer is going to overlap, overlap with a sliver of lung squamous cell cancer and a sliver of this and a sliver of that. And we can get lots of specimens from head and neck cancer patients very easily. So hopefully drug companies will say, oh, we need 25 biopsies. Do we want to do core needle biopsies of somebody's liver or cause pneumothorax or whatever we got to do to get them or do we want to just have them open up in their mouth and take a little piece of it. Um, so what about head and neck cancer? Here's the challenges. You know, squamous cell, and I throw in lung a little bit too, lung squamous cell because lung squamous cell doesn't have great targets right now either. And I think they're going to be very similar as the data comes out for head and neck squamous cell um, from TCGA. Um, so there's not great targets. They're not oncogene addicted. Um, the targeted therapies have poor efficacy, as Dan was showing, um, and subtypes are not well defined. So the big challenge is how do we get to simultaneously identify subsets of head and neck and lung squamous cell carcinoma and find effective molecular therapeutics. Um, and these in tumors that have no driver mutations. So that's a pretty tall order. So uh, Dan did, gave a great introduction to HPV. I'm going to talk a little bit about the stuff we have done in lab with HPV positive tumors. And this is a pretty remarkable graph that is from our patients at Vanderbilt on a prospective cohort that we collected. The top line is the HPV positives and the bottom line is the HPV negatives. If you see the lines that separate like that, you think you've got two different disease processes you're looking at. And, and that's the truth. These were all advanced stage three and four. So years ago, we looked at gene expression, and you can see the red versus the green. These tumors are totally separate in their gene expression. Unfortunately, it didn't really lead to any targeted therapies. So we moved on to proteomics, did this in conjunction with Gordon Mills' uh, group at MD Anderson, and um, we had a bunch of tumors, and the remarkable thing was all the HPV segregated on unsupervised clustering using just these 120 markers into these two groups. Um, with HPV negatives into the other two groups. And out of those groups, we noticed a couple of proteins that we were interested in. One was uh, PARP and the other was uh, XRCC1. Both are involved in single strand break repair. And we knew that these tumors respond much better to radiation and to cisplatin. And so we said, well, maybe there's something going on here. Um, the quantification you can just see at the bottom is significant between the two and you know for us surgeon types we just look for red and green and um, don't worry too much about the statistics. So um, this is PARP activity in these tumors so the top panels um, maybe I have a laser oh look at that so <laughs> the top panels are PAR staining which is um, the outcome of PARP activity the, the bottom uh, this is the PAR intensity from this type of staining, and this is PARP activity from an enzymatic test. And you can see that HPV positives have much more PARP activity compared to HPV negatives. So it's saying these tumors, for some reason, have turned on PARP. 
And then if you look at radiation sensitivity in cell lines for head and neck for HPV positive, there's only three or four in the world. And um, what you can see is this green line is the HPV positive tumors, this logarithmic scale. So you can see these tumors respond much better to radiation. We knew this in the clinic. We wanted to see if the cell lines were responding like our clinic samples do. Chemotherapy is the same thing. 6 thioguananines sort of behaves like uh, cisplatin. This is hydroxyurea. Once again, the green lines are the HPV positive tumors. And then if you look at uh, DNA damage after treatment with hydroxyurea, this is pulse field gel electrophoresis. And you can see the HPV positive tumors. Let's just concentrate on this one. HPV positives over here, HPV negatives over here. This is cell lines. So you can see at higher doses of hydroxyurea, you start seeing increasing amounts of DNA damage, which are these lower bands, sort of this area, um, are increased in the HPV positive tumors. So they have more damage with similar treatments compared to negative. We, these show two lines, but we've done more. Um, and it's universally true for HPV positive uh, cell lines. If we take a dose of hydroxyurea that basically creates about the same amount of double strand breaks in the negatives and the positives, treat the uh, tumors and then release them and let them start proliferating. What you can see is the HPV positive tumors increase their DNA double strand breaks after they start proliferating, whereas the HPV negative tumors do not nearly as much. So it's saying something about they don't repair well, but they start proliferating, and we're continuing to work on this with some more detailed studies. So they have some problems with repairing DNA and then proliferating. Um, and then at the end, it just shows for radiation and for um, hydroxyurea treatments, a, a similar thing with HPV positive and negative. So looking a little bit at their, re, um, their response to damage, this was one interesting finding. We saw XRCC1 was increased in HPV positive tumors. And this is a primary HPV positive tumor. So we take cells from the operating room and grow them in culture, and then we can treat the primary cells. Because there's only three HPV positive cell lines, we want to know if this is a universal uh, effect or if it's just those three cell lines. So we've done this with, I think, three or four primary cultures that we grow short term and then treat. So what you can see is without treatment, so these are the control cells, this is a primary HPV negative, a primary HPV positive. Without treatment, um, this is PAR, so the um, PARP activity basically. So you can see there's a lot of PAR here and almost none here, a lot of XRCC1 in foci here and very few here. And after you treat these cells in hydroxyurea, what you can see is you start seeing PAR and XRCC1 in the HPV negatives. You saw it already in the HPV positives. So HPV positives start with a lot of um, XRCC1 staining in this case, whereas HPV negatives start with very little. So these cells are stressed somehow. They have a lot of single strand breaks. They're stressed, they're having to repair. We don't know the mechanisms behind that, but we're exploring those at a ba more basic level. But what you see is when you, when you stress them further, they just can't increase much more above where they were as opposed to these cells that really markedly increase their XRCC1 foci. So maybe they're already stressed maximally. You give them a little more damage, they don't know what to do with it. I also want to talk about double strand breaks or, 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 and homologous recombination. So RAD51 foci is kind of a marker for repair of um, double strand breaks with homologous recombination. Once again, we treat it with hydroxyurea. The green is RAD51, the red is gamma H2AX. Gamma H2AX is just a marker of DNA damage. So you can see the HPV positive cell lines, and there's two here, HPV negative cell lines here. You treat them with hydroxyurea. They have DNA damage, so they're all stained red here with gamma H2AX. But RAD51, a marker of homologous recombination, there's very little in the HPV positive uh, cell lines but you start seeing these foci appearing in the HPV negative uh, cell line. So they're saying the negatives are at least initially repairing and RAD51 is the recombinase, so you think they probably are repairing, um, whereas the HPV positives aren't repairing. So 
where do we go, I mean, you know, for targeted therapy from this? So if they're already stressed, they're having trouble with homologous recombination, and they got a lot of single strand breaks, it might make sense to inhibit PARP. The PARP act, uh, inhibitors have made a big slash with BRCA uh, tumors that are homologous recombination deficiency, deficient. So we started doing studies on cell lines, and we put some cell lines in mice that I'm not going to show the data here. But once again, these tumors are more sensitive to PARP inhibition than all the other cell lines, so these green ones. So PARP inhibition may be a way to de-escalate therapy rationally in HPV-positive tumors. Um, you know, cetuximab in HPV-positive tumors, I don't know um, what that may do. It, it, it may have some effect, but um, it's, I think, uh, not not clearly um, linked as to how that's going to progress. So now I want to switch gears and, um, uh, and talk about adenoid cystic just because we, d we do a lot of things in the lab and um, salivary tumors is, has been one of our emphasis over the last couple of years. So it's this adenoid cystic carcinoma is a pretty rare tumor. I, I think around 10,000 cases a year in the United States. It's the second most common salivary tumor. They're slow growing neurotrophic. They're treated with surgery. Some people give radiation afterwards, but it's never been shown to do much, although we do it. Um, survival is pretty good at five years, but at 15 years it really decreases. So these tumors recur late, usually with distant metastasis, and when they recur, we have nothing to do for them. So we did some gene expression analysis, and, and once again, I don't want you to look at the details here, but you know, just from the surgeon's standpoint, I look for red versus green. I can see a line going down through here, and um, the adenoid cystics are all of these red genes we selected, and these um, MEX, mucopodromoid carcinomas, and head and neck glands are all these over here. And so um, a few genes we were interested in, this, a lot of these genes had, were neuro, uh, neurologic developmental genes or neurotrophins. So we're interested in this NTREC3, which is TRAC C, which is a neurotrophin receptor, um, because it was um, activated universally in all these adenoid cystics. We compared some, compared some adenoid cystic xenografts and combined them with the adenoid cystic carcinomas. We got these from Musculuck in uh, Virginia, Dr. Musculuck in Virginia. And once again, they all paired together. So it said these are a good model. These xenografts are a good model. And there's no cell lines for adenoid cystic carcinoma in the world. So you've got to deal with xenografts if you're going to test these tumors. So this is just showing that the, both the xenografts, which are the X's, and the patient tumors, which no, have no X. The red line is the track C. The blue line is track B. So you can see track B is expressed in head and neck squames and some mechs and some um, ACCs, but the red is almost exclusively in the adenoid cystic carcinomas with almost none in the rest. And this just shows by immunohistochemistry. Sure enough, they express track C. These are all adenoid cystic carcinomas. The pattern is very reminiscent of the pattern for phosphoerc 1 and 2. You can see at the leading edge or the outside of these tumor nests. And BCL2 has also been associated with downstream tract signaling, so we stain for BCL2 as well, and these tumors are all highly positive for BCL2. So finally, we went into some mice with this because there's no cell lines that you can test. Um, there's about 11 mouse models, of which about six are useful because the others grow so um, poorly. So uh, in two of these mice, ACCX6 and X9, we treated with a TREK inhibitor from AstraZeneca, and you can see quite a good response, but um, not a decrease in tumor size um, on, for either one. And um, we labeled the cells, we labeled the mice with BRDU before we sacrificed, and you can see for this ACCX9, which had n the less good response, the um, proliferative index went from 17 to 5 percent, and this was at 30 days, so close to the end of the study. And I think had we extended these studies in time, those, they would have been significant results. Um, these are very slow-growing tumors, so these are pretty painful experiments to uh, undertake. We uh, partnered with the Adenoid Cystic Carcinoma Research Foundation to um, perform those studies, and they were very supportive of, of that work. So um, once potential therapies are identified, how do you predict clinical efficacy? Because there's going to be a lot, of, um, a lot of data coming out, you know, with all the deep sequencing that's going on. 
clinical trials aren't feasible, and some of the um, preclinical models are, are, have been inadequate. Cell lines may not represent the diversity of the disease, and genetically engineered in mouse models um, can game the system a little bit. So one of our goals was to develop a model that could be useful, uh, cheap, and tractable. So what did we want to um, do? Um, we wanted to mimic the human disease. Um, we wanted to avoid cell lines if at all possible. And the reason being is because right now, um, only about 11% of drugs that enter phase one are approved, and $400 million is spent per failed drug. <coughs> So if we can increase the approval rate by having a better preclinical model, then we theoretically could save you know, a lot of money. So here's what we wanted in a model. Not all of these are possible in any one model. But here's what we ended up. Um, for head and neck cancer, uh, squamous cell carcinoma, um, each, we found out each tumor is different. So salivary tumors like different things, of course, than head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. I'll talk a little bit about head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. We grow them short-term in culture. The reason we started growing them short-term in culture is because they're all infected. They come out of people's mouths or throats, and if you put it, that into the back of a nude mouse, you get an infection. So we, we cleaned them up by culturing them overnight. We also can use that as an opportunity to infect them. So then we use this denuded rat trachea. We put the cells inside the denuded rat trachea, and the reason we did that is because when we just injected sub-Q with matrigel or alone or put chunks under the skin or put them under the renal capsule as cells or chunks or with matrigel, they didn't grow very well, so they grew best in this model. There was no way to predict that, but you can also grow normal cells in this model. So if you put in normal squamous epithelium, you'll get squamous epithelium. Put in respiratory epithelium, you get respiratory epithelium. You put these, um, put the cells in here and plant them under the nude mouse skin, flip it up and then you wait. And after several weeks uh, to a month, you get um, squamous cell carcinoma that grows, that looks like squamous cell carcinoma, it looks like what you put in. And so this is cytokeratin staining and you know just different magnifications. They're proliferating, so KI67. And this is KU, KU is just a marker of human for us um, because we used a human specific KU antibody. We also wanted to track whether or not these tumors were growing, and it's hard to tell if they're growing inside those tracheas unless they grow outside the trachea. So we went to a luciferase model. This just shows that with the luciferase model, you can see there's sort of exponential growth. Maybe at the end, they tail off a little bit. Um, and so this is sort of what we ended up with was this model to, for preclinical testing. It's about 80% successful. We, we use this luciferase expression to measure growth, but there's some problems with it, so now we're looking for uh, using some fluorescent um, proteins, um, and we think it's promising for preclinical models. We've also frozen some cells after we grow them short term and bring them back later, and they're still alive. And um, we like this because um, right now, if we're gonna do any kind of preclinical testing, and especially if we're talking about subsets of head and neck cancer, we have to grow them and treat them and we may not know what subset they are. What we'd like to do is have a freezer full of live cells and after we determine a subset we're interested in, we go pull 20 of them out, put them into mice and test those 20 tumors versus some other ones. So I think this will work. We haven't tried it with uh, lung squamous cell carcinoma, but um, we can grow lung squamous cell carcinoma just like we can head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. So, um, where the transformation in cancer therapy, these genomic proteomic tools are making a big difference um, in what we're thinking about. Um, but there's going to be complexities related to combinatorial therapy, and um, we've used some computational modeling to try to figure out which combinations to use. I think there's some um, value in that, and we can use xenografts to test logical combinations. So. I think there's really some things that are best performed at academic centers like Yale. Um, we have the patients and we have the tools. Um, so we can identify targets and we can identify subsets of tumors susceptible to that target. Now, you know, it's not easy, it takes a lot of work, but, but we do have the, the tools and the ability to do that. What's a little more challenging for, I think, a lot of people is identifying lead compounds for things that already don't have those 
and also for identifying subsets of patients samples that will respond and testing those in preclinical models. So a lot of people can do cell lines, a lot of people can do that type of work, but uh, if you want to get away from the cell line and go back to something that's a little closer to the patient, I think that's a, a roadblock um, for a lot of people. So once again, our question was how to identify subsets of head and neck cancer salivary patients for molecular therapeutics. Right now we're doing this. So we're identifying cell lines that match tumor subgroups. The TCGA data for head and neck will be coming out fairly soon. As soon as that's out, we're already sequencing cell lines that we created because we have the blood from the same patient, so we know which ones are SNPs and which ones are true mutations and things like that. So we're gonna hopefully have enough cell lines to say, oh, it looks like this subgroup of patients based on mutation status, methylation, whatever else. Um, we're we're working on developing and tasting, uh, testing targeted agents, and we'll use these cell lines to do that and, um, based on an understanding of the pathways. So this is really what is, uh, I, I think, the next step. Um, we ideally would like to test patients as they come in um, and have their subtypes predetermined, have their tumors viably banked, and then after we develop something that may be promising using cell lines, take it back to these viably banked tumors and test the efficacy on real patient tumors grown in mice. Um, and then, of course, if that looks effective, we can perform trials, especially phase zeros. Um, so why would anybody invest in doing that last step? Why would somebody say, oh, we'll sequence your tumors for you um, and, you know, we'll do, all, um, do the analysis and help identify subtypes? Well, the reason to invest is this personalized cancer therapy, if you're the first one doing it and doing it well, you're going to get the funding, the trials, and the patients. So that's exactly what we want to do. And so for some little bit of seed money to find out these subtypes, we can possibly progress through that. And let me tell you, if you have a trial on adenoid cystic carcinoma, even though there's only 10,000 patients a year, if you've got a rational, targeted reason to do it, patients will come flocking. I get calls every month from patients who have nothing to do because they've got metastatic disease and their doctors told them, just live with it, you're gonna die, but we don't have anything to give you. And it's also gonna be a major driver of reimbursement. Pay for performance, y'all probably heard about that. So. Whoever does it the best is going to get paid more. So right now is the time to invest to get these things going, and I know Yale's already doing that, so that's great. So it's going to require a concerted effort, identifying subtypes, targets, and effective drugs is coming, and there's going to be a lot of informatics that are needed. So that's the end. <laughs> Thank you, Dal, and Tell's colleagues. And we have time for a couple of questions.